So one of the goals of our Lenten journey is to pray more. And so with the scriptures this Sunday, I want to give you three different areas where you might try to pray. So the first one is going to be three tents. The second one is going to be about knowing the ending. And the last one is a question, is God for us? So first, three tents. You know, on the gospel, Peter's so excited. He, uh, you know, just six days earlier, Peter was with Jesus in Caesarea Philippi, and he professed Jesus as the Christ, and then immediately after, Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. So Peter is feeling a little bit beat up, and then all of a sudden, he's on this mountain with Jesus. And as he's on this mountain with Jesus and James and John, he sees the glory of the Lord, and he's so excited because then he sees Moses and Elijah. And so he thinks, okay, I'll try again. And he goes up to Jesus and says, okay, how about if I build three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah? Now, Jesus doesn't respond, but we have to go back to the Old Testament to understand the significance of a tent. A tent is also referred to as a tabernacle. It's what the Ark of the Covenant was kept in as the Israelites traveled through the desert. And so when Peter says, I'll build three tents, he's missing the point of the significance of Jesus's revelation. He's equating Jesus and Moses and Elijah with each other as equals. And so he fails to recognize the preeminence of the revelation of God in Jesus Christ. Now, we can look at Peter and go, wow, how could he miss it? I mean, it's shining right in front of his face, right? So I just want you to think about what you're planning to do for the rest of the day. What are the things on your agenda today? Are you going to clean your house? Are you going to do a little more work? Are you going to spend time with your family? What are the things that matter to you? And what priority do they have? Obviously, this is a priority for you. You're here. You want to worship God. You want to dedicate yourselves to God during this hour. What are the rest of the hours going to be like? And it starts to give us a way to understand, am I really placing God first? Am I recognizing that only God is God and only God has the right to occupy the first place in my life? If I start to equate other things and God is just a box alongside other boxes, then I'm doing what Peter was doing and trying to build three tents. God only wants one tabernacle. And the tabernacle he wants is the tabernacle of our heart. He wants to have a home in our heart, and he doesn't want that home to be shared with any other gods. And so we have to really be careful not to allow ourselves to worship more than one God. There is only one God. Now that leads us to knowing the ending of a story. You know, there are a couple of movies that I like to watch over and over again. Probably most of you have your favorite movie that you've watched more than once. Now, for me, one of them is Forrest Gump. I love Forrest Gump. And it doesn't matter how many times I watch that movie, I always get something more out of it. And I always hate Jenny's boyfriends. She makes bad choices. But you know what? No matter how many times I watch it, I cry at the end every single time. There's not a time I watch it that I don't cry and it's still the same story. Why is that? Now, another one I don't cry so much at is We Were Soldiers. I love that, it's a Mel Gibson movie, it's violent, it's pretty rough, but it's a leadership movie. It's about what does a leader do when things are almost hopeless? What does a leader do when things are rough? I like that movie, and I go back to it again and again because sometimes things get rough, and we need to remember that there's always something more. There's always more that we can do, and we're never out of options. Well, I like those movies, but if you think about it, the Transfiguration was really showing Peter, James, and John the end of the story, right? They're about to go to Jerusalem. That's why they're on the mountaintop. They're looking over Galilee, Jesus' favorite place in the world, and they're about to go to Jerusalem where Jesus is gonna suffer and die on the cross and be buried. But he's gonna rise from the dead three days later. 
They don't know that. And so Jesus shows them the end of the story. He shows them everything's going to be okay. But it still doesn't change the nature of the story. It still doesn't change the fact that Jesus really is going to suffer and die on a cross. And it really is still going to scandalize them so much so that everybody runs away. Knowing the end of the story doesn't always make it easy. Sometimes we think if we knew how our lives were going to end, it would make today a little bit better. Knowing the end of the story is something we already have. We already know how this story ends. We already know that God desires to save us. We already know that God has given us the gift of salvation. We already know that in the end, if we remain faithful, we will be victorious. So we actually do know the end of the story. And that's where that question comes in from St. Paul today. If God is for us, who can be against us? Except the lived reality of our lives sometimes causes that to be a question. Is God actually for us? Is God really on our side? Because if God is on our side, why am I not having such a great time? If God is on my side, why is Abraham asked to sacrifice his only son? The first reading is probably one of the most troubling readings of the entire Old Testament. It's troubling because first, we're horrified that God would even ask that of Abraham. That God would even say, sacrifice your son. But we have to remember, this is a test. God does not want him to sacrifice his son. God is asking Abraham, how much do you trust me? How much are you willing to trust that I can make this all work out okay? Now, I don't always share a lot about my 30-day retreat uh, because it's really still ruminating in me, but I'll tell you one of the things I learned on my 30-day silent retreat is I went to God and God kept inviting me to trust him more. And I was like, God, I, I really love you. I really trust you. I, I, wanna, I wanna give everything to you. And God, of course, asked me, he said, do you trust me with the details? Hmm. I trust him with the big ideas. I trust him with the grand plan, but the details, like what am I going to do today? What are my priorities gonna be? Or if I have a problem that I can't quite figure out, am I really gonna trust God with the details of that? You see, God isn't just asking us to give him a vague concept of trust. He's asking us to trust him with the stuff that really matters, with the details of our lives, with the individual decisions we make every day, to bring those decisions to him. And that's why St. Paul has to say to us in the second reading, if God is for us, and St. Paul is absolutely convinced that he is, if God is for us, who can be against us? And so the prayer is actually to go back to that question. Do I believe that God is for me? Do I trust that God wants what is good for me? Am I willing to believe that even in the details of my life, that God is bringing his plan forward in a way that will lead to the salvation of the world? It's just three areas for us to pray about. Am I really allowing God to take up root and be at home in the tabernacle of my heart? Do I really believe that in all things, God is at work? Am I able to recognize that I already know the end of the story and so I don't have to be anxious about today because I know that God is bringing this forward in his plan? And can I trust God? Can I trust him with the things of my life that really matter to me? Can I trust him with the things that scare me, that make me uncertain, that cause pain? Because God gave of himself his own son his beloved son, and he wants us to hear that same message. He wants us to know that you are my beloved son. You are my beloved daughter with whom I am well pleased. 